when that happened, I had a moment with the Lord. I'm going to start crying right away. Someone told me once um, recently, and she said, you carry revival in your heart, and you're meant to be a catalyst. And I was in this airport, and I'm telling you, Israelis, when we're upset, everybody's upset, everybody's complaining, everybody. And I had four kids, and it wasn't just a delay. We waited for hours, and then we went out to the plane, and then they brought us back in from the plane, and then they canceled the plane, and they didn't know what to do with us because we had already gone through customs. We had already gone through duty exchange. They didn't know what to do, so we were in a holding space. And I said, God, if I really carry this in me, I'm going to test you. <laughs> and I said, if I can get this room, everybody dancing, then I know I have something. And I knew the way to do it was not on my own. And I went and found a group of girls and I got them involved and another group of girls and got them involved. And all these people had these MP3 speaker systems. <laughs> and we put it on and I stood up on a chair and I just said, you know, if you know this, you know, sing. And I got my kids and they ended up doing circles and dancing. And we had Guy in a wheelchair wheeling himself around the room. <laughs> and the staff, it was so loud and full of joy. They didn't know what to do with us because we couldn't hear the loudspeakers telling us what to do. Um, and... Uh, we were 10 days in Crete, and I, and I just asked my son recently, I said, you know, what was the most special thing for you? And one of the things he said was at that airport that day. So praise God. <laughs> it's there. It, it is in me, and I'm uh, excited to see what God's going to do today. I was ready to, like, had some jokes and stuff, but, you know... Um, I really feel like there's such a seriousness to what God wants to do today, right now, and, um, and I don't want to take away from that. So I, ju I just want to pray before I start, um, that's okay with you, and I might do it a couple times in the middle of this message because I have been carrying this message for, I think, six months, um, but it's my life message, I think. Um, Lorena had called me a few months ago and said, you know, we'd like you to speak and everything. And we was like, oh, I don't know. It depends on what the subject is. And she said, he And I didn't even have to think about it for a second. I was like, yes, this is me. I can do this. I don't need notes. I don't need anything. Like this is me. This is my heart. This is what I live. I breathe. I sleep this. And it's so strong in me that it's more like, God, please contain me to figure out exactly what it is that you want for me to share. So I'm just going to pray, and then I'm going to get right into it. Father, thank you so much that you have said, Enani, first. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for carrying this. Lord, I pray that I would be just the vessel to carry this word through. I thank you for family, this family, my family, Lord. I thank you for everybody who's here today, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would open ourselves and become vulnerable before you and hear what you have for us today. In Yeshua's name, amen. So, <clears throat> I was going to start by saying I'm an author now. <laughs> but not like my father. Um, this, is, this is just something that was so out of my comfort zone. And I, I want to share just a quick story. And this was the most recent God, okay, use me if this is from you moment. 
Um, Jonathan and I pastor a congregation in Israel called Alavat Yeshua. And um, we have this wonderful, special older lady. I think she's 80s. And um, she, she's a wonderful woman. She is so wonderful. And, and um, I was asking the Lord about her. And I was asking the Lord, God, I want to know this woman more. I want to know what is her purpose. What is her destiny? She's an older woman and married, and her husband had been sick for four years in an apartment that he couldn't get out of because he was sick with polio. And I was talking to her, and I decided I needed to start to be intentional. And I found out she wrote a book. And I said, give me your book. And I read her book, and I felt that God just downloaded, transferred a supernatural love for her and the ability to see her through God's eyes. And I felt that her story needed to be told to the next generation. And I went up to her and I said, you need to write a children's book. And she said, and she's an artist and everything. And she said, no, that's for you to do. <laughs> she said, you got it. I want you to do it. So I went home and I said, okay, God, if this is from you, I, I love art. I'm a painter. I don't know how to do illustrations, cartoons, anything other than this in my life. And um, I said, if this is from you, you'll give me the pictures, you'll give me the words, and it'll happen like this. And I wrote this book within a month and did all the illustrations. It's not just a book. It's, a, it's her story. And this all happened. God, I mean, there's so much to share. The Jesus revolution and the movie and what happened with Asbury, God did something incredible inside of my heart watching the live stream through Asbury. And I was just feeling so much stirring and the need for the next generation to know and that be passed on to the next generation. And that's this. This is her story, searching for the Lord and finding him in Hawaii during the Jesus movement. And um, this woman does not have any um, children. And we just came out with this book two weeks ago. That's it. And I was like, God, if it's you, I'll have it ready for the conference. And it's here. And one week after I got this um, on Amazon, she didn't, she doesn't even have a copy of this yet. Her husband passed away. And I felt like God knew this was a part of her legacy, but not just her legacy. It's a legacy that needs to be told to the next generation. And if you are older in this room, and even if you don't have children, I had her stand up this, the last hour we just had, we had all the kids up front saying the ironic benediction over them, and I had her stand up and I said, these are your children now. This is your family. And um, there is so much that needs to be shared with the children there is a reason why we have grandparents and children, and grandparents love to tell stories. There is a reason. There is a reason why as the older generation grows, they need more routine. They need more specific foods. They might even go into diapers. There is a similarity and an understanding between the older generation and the children. And so anyway, um, I, this is the book. It's on sale. You know, I'm selling it because I need to make the money back, but I really don't care about the money. I want this story to be told, and I want the Jesus revolution and that stirring in our hearts to be rebirthed. Um, the lie that I felt when I was running, one of the um, revelations I had is we're so used to hearing, oh, this generation's not like us. It wasn't like that when I grew up. And we keep trying to create this distance between generations. And as I watched the Jesus Revolution, I just felt like God was like, it is the same. I am the same God. I have not changed. And this is the story that I feel like he is saying to us. And, and the truth is that we are joined together. We are not so different. And um, that is just what I wanted to share about that story. <laughs> um, so praise God for that. Um, so, uh, as my brother said, I, I grew up coming here to the Coon Conferences. You guys are family. It has been so wonderful to connect with so many of you all. 
Um, and when I was 18, I moved to Israel, as Ben said, and that was, that was a huge, a huge change for me. Um, when I was 16, I first went, I was in Israel, and I was part of a dance, a dance group, and um, I did not want to move to Israel. I did not want citizenship. I was not interested and I was a part of this dance group, and we were to dance around for three weeks, and we were with Israelis and Americans together. And um, this is the year 2000, and it was um, one of the best, most powerful experiences that this particular camp had ever had, and I'll tell you why. Uh, my brother had passed away two years previously, and while I was in this camp, the very first week, I think it was the first day it was supposed to start, my roommate's brother passed away on a motorcycle accident. And in this same group of girls, a girl had lost her dad six months prior, and another girl had uh, her mother and sister were in a car accident, and her mother was decapitated, and her sister and the baby was... Um, died in a car accident. So it was, it was a time where it was like, let's take all the grief, traumatic, PTSD kids and put them in the same room together for three weeks without parents. <laughs> it was insane. And we were all struggling and trying to find our purpose. And I'm even thinking, what if I'm cursed? You know, like, what is going on here? I don't understand. And we all had to go through this, this battle with the Lord of coming through suffering and witnessing and going to different refugee camps and prisons and, and, and this wail inside of us, literally, wail screaming, coming out sometimes. By the end of this trip, um, God had completely changed my life and turned my life around, and I knew that Israel was supposed to be my home and it was my destiny, and I was 16 years old. I went back to America. I was supposed to graduate high school. I did um, like the honors courses and everything, and I was ready to go to college. And two, a couple of weeks before I graduated, I got my Israeli induction um, letter. And I started questioning, God, what if I heard you wrong? <laughs> I don't know about this. I'm like, 18 came way faster than I expected. And um, he had me, I was in the youth group, and I did one of those flip open your Bibles, and I opened up to Ezekiel 2, and the first words that were written said, go, I'm calling you to Israel. <laughs> I'm calling you to a nation and a people that you don't understand them, you don't understand their language, and I'm calling you to eat the scroll. I don't know if you know this passage. Um, of the bitterness and the suffering, and to swallow it, and and that and 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 I knew I knew then at a very young age this this was it for me, and that just opened the door to so many um, moments and so many testimonies uh, of me being able to share my faith. When I was in the army, one of um, I taught in the public school system, and you think today like. It's not possible to share your faith if you're an adult, and especially in Israel, it is a crime to do that to witness to a minor. And I was in the army, and I think because of my age, it was an open door. So I remember at the very end of my service, I was like, I'm going to go out with a bang. <laughs> and um, I had one of my classes. Oh, a little background, Israeli schools, there's like no order in high school. Kids like throw paper in planes and it's just not, it's just not the same as far as respect goes. But as an American and a soldier, I had their ear because it was like, who is this girl? <laughs> what is she doing here? She's not quite a teacher. She's a soldier coming in uniform. And um, I remember I got to share, and I just decided my last lesson with each of my schools would be to share my testimony. And I shared my testimony in one of my classes. I was teaching, I think, to like 70 kids. The bell rang to go to break, and nobody moved.
that power, that boldness is inside every one of you. It's nothing special that I carry. I made a decision when I was 14 when my brother died and I said, my life is not worth it. If you are not leading it, it doesn't matter where I am in the world. If you're not the one beside me, if you're not the one directing me, And there's just, there's so many amazing stories. I, I want to share with you, before I get into the word, what Hineni means for me. When you're a parent and you have a child, there's an automatic thing that happens the moment you hold that baby in your arms. And this mama bear, father bear heart comes out and there's a no matter what, I will love you, I will be there for you. And it just, it, it just happens. And you're holding that baby and you look in the baby's arms and it's this, here I am. For the Lord, what I feel like, I have two pictures in my head when I hear this, he nanny. The first picture is this kind of stance. You know, the longer you stand like this, the more awkward it gets. And we can do it for like a second. <laughs> but the longer you stand like that, the more you see, the more imperfections you notice, the more naked you feel. And that stance creates a vulnerability. It creates a vulnerability of saying, God, okay, you see me. You see all of me. But yet you accept me you see where I haven't forgiven someone. You see the, just, just every, every bit of everything he sees it all. And the only way to be vulnerable, I feel like, is to completely be like this. And I imagine like, I think it's Star Trek where the people stand and they like get moved and then they like get dropped. And I feel like that stance is what I've had to create and do and just say, okay, God, it's all out there. It's all out there. Take me, move me, place me. And then when I land, it's like, yeah, I'm ready. Right? And the other part, <laughs> I'm going to take a chair here. I want you to get this visual. It's very important to me. The other part of Hineni is <clears throat> the vulnerability. And then I don't, you not, might not be able to see it, but I'll just explain it. Imagine sitting in a chair wrapping your legs around it and holding on and every bit of opposition coming and moving you and you can't move off of that chair. It requires a stubbornness. It requires a knowing who you are and say, I am not getting off of this chair. I'm not getting off of this train and I'm going forward and I'm not moving back because of this already happened. You already gave everything. So now I'm sitting and I'm standing firm on what I know to be true, what I know God has called me to do. So I'm going to um, read you something. <laughs> um, the... It's so awesome. God is so amazing. Um, I think Ken was, Fish talked about this yesterday, and I thought it was so cool. Um, the person in the Bible that I relate to most that said Hineni was Ananias and Paul. And I paint a picture for you in Acts chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. It says, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. 
He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. I want you to understand for a moment what that must have felt like. House to house. We're not saying, okay, you can't worship out there. It's COVID. (laughs) You're not allowed to meet. If you do, we'll get you out in that building. I'm not saying, no, you can't preach in your schools. If you do this, this will be in trouble. I'm telling you, knocking on doors, house to house. And I know this happens around the world still and is still happening, but we don't know what that feels like. Most of us here don't know what that feels like. That that kind of fear. I have a neighbor that we actually never really met um, in Israel. And when I... Thank God he's healed me of this. But there was a fear in me every time I saw him because it was like his vendetta to get us. He even cursed our family last year and said, by this time next year, you all won't be living in this house. Never even met us. He even tried um, sending us a letter to sue us for something that he made up. And, And we just knew because of the way that we felt every time he talked to us, we just felt like throwing up, and we don't even know, like I said, we don't even know this neighbor, and knew it was a spiritual attack. So I, I take that, and I know, just think, Paul going house to house, dragging believers out and putting them in prison. And then we go to Acts 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. This guy was thirsty for blood. It wasn't enough that he had his neighborhood. It wasn't enough that he had his whole town. He was so thirsty for blood. He went to another city, another area, and said, can I go there? I want more. It's not enough. Can you imagine someone being full with so much hatred? And in his mind, it was righteousness. In his mind, he thought he was doing the right thing. I'm going to be so vulnerable with you all right now and tell you something. This year, one of the scariest things in my life happened to me. And part of this trip, I know, is for the Lord to bring healing to this. But I feel like I need to share this. We had another neighbor that I met and brought into our home. And I felt like the Lord said, bring her in. And we brought her part of our Shabbat service, and she met my children it was one of the most amazing things I've ever experienced. And I had just met her. And I had shared my testimony with her, and she opened up about her life. And afterwards, she invited me to her house, and she said she had the best time. And I came over to her house and into her territory. And she found out that we believe in something called right and wrong. That night, she wrote me and my husband and said, I'm going to social services and we're going to take your children away. And she started to threaten us and I freaked out. And right before I came here, I had a friend tell me and she said, you know what? 
I think one of the reasons why this is affecting you so much is because your son is about to be 12 years old. <laughs> and you were so scared that you were going to lose him like you lost your brother. And I knew in that moment that Satan was trying to get me to not say, use me, Lord, send me. And I came to the place with the Lord, and I said, God, if I had to do it all over again, I would. I would invite her into my house with open arms. Because God is that good that that's the price that I'm willing to pay. And I know it. So when I read these words, this woman felt like she had a vendetta and that she was standing up for righteousness. In her mind, she's saving my children. In Paul's mind, he's holding up the Torah. He was spiritually blind. I'm going to skip over to verse 10 through 19. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Hineni, he answered. Yes, Lord. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. This is so much fun. Okay. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go! This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Yeshua, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has set me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, a week ago, I was praying, and I get a lot of my revelations at night when I'm going and going and over this message over and over and over again. And this whole time, my focus has been on Ananias, and I know this is the focus, but God revealed to me another part and a little bit of his humor. So I'll come back to Ananias. Paul was made to be blind. Paul was made to feel vulnerable. Paul maybe felt the same fear that he invoked into the believers. Imagine, imagine being blind and God says, I'm sending you to the people that you have been murdering who would love to take your life and have justice made. Can we not just imagine for a minute how good it would be to just be like, yes, I knew God was on my side. He sent Paul to me and he's ready and he can't even see who's killing him. Like maybe I, I mean, there had to have been zealot Christians. I'm sure there were. I'm sure there were the people that were standing up on the Capitol, standing for righteousness and saying, you know, you shall not pass. You are evil and, and, and you will be judged, right? I mean, there had to be somebody who maybe had a knife or who would think, I hear Paul's coming and I can just wait in the shadows and kill him and nobody would know. No one would know. Can, can you just imagine what that would be like? Here's Paul, blind, completely vulnerable on this side. And here's Ananias on this side. God, you want me to do what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like, like, like I mean, 
How could we not question that? And both people having to be so vulnerable before the Lord to come to that meeting place where he could redeem it. You don't know what God is doing in the other person's heart. You don't know. That's the beauty of the Lord. You know, I wasn't going to share this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it. Um, one of the communities that I think is portrayed, I, I live in Israel, so it's a little different for us, but one of the communities that is portrayed to be the most grotesquely stand in your face, I hate you believers community is, who knows it? Say it. No. Not the Orthodox. The LGBTQ community. What do I mean by grotesque in your face? I mean, there's such a divide between people and identity and, and the parades and the month and the everything that's happening. Our immediate reaction is to go, ugh, right? That's not for me when the reaction that needs to happen is our arms wide open and our arms say, come, I will love you. The hippies, the door was closed to them. What I loved in that movie was they said the church's doors were closed. And when the hippies first came, I loved what they did in this movie. They didn't know what they were doing. I love that they came up barefoot and whatever they knew about God, that's what they did. They didn't have it all. They didn't have all the scriptures. They just knew we need truth, and I need truth so bad, and I will take any bit, any morsel of it I can get. And I'm telling you, the LGBT community is starving for love. So they are shouting in the worst way possible. It doesn't make sense when you have a child who is kicking and screaming and the parent says, oh, he just needs love. But that's how we are. The one who kicks and screams the loudest is the one whose heart is the most ready and the most broken and the most needing of our love. Paul did not deserve it. He was the loudest. He was the loudest, and God needed someone ready enough, trusting in him enough. To give that gift to. I want to tell you, and I want to end with a couple things so you know just how worth it. <laughs> it is so worth it. Isaiah 35. This is a scripture that I hold on to with every bit of my being. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. I imagine just sometimes we're buckling under the pressure, under the burdens that we're feeling, under things that just seem too hard to handle. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. 
He will come with vengeance. He will come with divine retribution, and he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool. The thirsty ground bubbling springs. I tell you, when I read that, and I saw that picture that Ken Frisch sent with the grass around the grave, can you just imagine standing in a desert and your feet are burning and suddenly a pool of water springs up? It's possible. It says that it will happen. It says the earth will do these things. And the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds, there we go, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. Every verse here is a promise of something that the Lord is fulfilling. Maybe you have something in your life that you're waiting for God to fulfill. Maybe you've given financially. Maybe you've given up your home. Maybe it's in your children. Maybe it's in your workplace. Everybody has a story and what they are working through with the Lord. And these are his promises to us. But only the redeemed will walk there. And the ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing an everlasting joy everlasting joy. Can you imagine what it's like to have something that lasts forever and it's his joy? Will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. Just think with me a minute. To be overtaken by something where you don't have control over it anymore. You are overtaken, you are overcome, and you can't stand anymore but in his presence and do that. And I'm crying, but I'm happy. <laughs> and sorrow and sighing will flee away. And friends, I have to tell you something that I'm so excited about. This is family. And I'm going to pull you into a moment, and she doesn't know I'm going to do this. I'm going to pull you into, I think for me, which is one of the most amazing moments in my life. God is the Redeemer. He redeems all things. He is such an amazing God. You guys don't know this woman, but my heart and my soul have been connected with hers for years. This is Danielle Chapman. My brother passed away in her home. I haven't seen her in 25 years. And God brings his healing and his redemption. And I'm here to say today that he is a loving God. He is a loving God. And he is a good God. And I don't care what you are going through. He knows. He knows it. And you will come through it with joy. 
and your sorrows and your sighing will flee away. And this is what is for us to pass on to this next generation. It is not that being a believer is so hard. It is not how much I've given up for the Lord. Hold on, I just got to get this going. It is not how much I gave up for him, but how much he gave up for me. Because he gave it all for you. That is the story we will tell our children. So, Danielle, I just want to honor you and tell you, you mean the world to this family, and we love you so much. And she's a representation of her whole family, and just thank God for her. Do you want to say something? She was eight years old when this took place, and um, it's been hard. We've wanted to get together with their family, but... The kept running into the pain. And I just want to honor you for coming and being willing to face the pain and get healed. Can we just pray for a minute, everyone? Can we just lift up? Just pray. This is what family looks like. You cannot be afraid to be vulnerable. It is only through our vulnerability that God can use us. Um, I have this song that I wrote, and the words were, what would happen and what could be if we really started doing the things that we believe in? I believe in this. I've waited 25 years for this, guys. It's possible. It is so possible. want to honor you for stewarding both the joy and the suffering of Messiah. And I'm just wrecked with the goodness of God. We are wrecked with the goodness of God. Thank you for like wrestling with the Lord. And this message was, was a, a steak dinner. It was so good. It was challenging. It was provoking. It was I felt like I received a discipline from the Lord and a kiss from the Lord at the same time. So thank you so much. Can we give the Lord a clap offering for Simcha? Thank you, Lord. All right, you may be seated. 
Without further ado, I just want to invite Troy. I want to honor Troy by not taking too much of the time. But I love my brother. I've grown to uh, work with him recently, and I just, I just love how prophetic of a teacher you are and how you honor the Lord by saying the hard things because you love God the most. <laughs> and you, you love God, you love neighbor, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I just want to... He's, uh, he's ours, right? Yeah. But he's also Jewish voice. And uh, I just want to pray for you. Mm-hmm. Abba Father, we thank you so much for Troy, our brother. Lord, I thank you that you've knitted us together as a family. Mm-hmm. Lord, I thank you for this man who honors you in the work of the kingdom. I Thank you, Lord, for this word that you've given him, Lord. Lord, it's a heavy word. So I pray that you empower him, Lord, with the ruach right now, that he would open his lips and that he would declare the praises of the Lord. Lord, I pray that you give him boldness to speak, Lord. Come with power over him. Anoint his lips in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So I just asked Ben, Ben, what should we do about the time? He said, don't worry about the time. So if you're worried about the time, Ben said you shouldn't be worried about the time. (laughs) Uh, I feel like I just need to do one thing. Um, to honor. Can I do just just a little honor? The other day I had about 70 minutes and I honored for 30. Today I have about 13 minutes, but I'm going to honor for two. Uh, Ben Juster. Some of us, not all of us, but some of us are watching you fulfill your destiny in front of our very eyes. And I just want to commend you. Living in your dad's shadow, I'm glad I'm not you, bro. (laughs) But I'm saying more than your dad. Dan, that's not to diminish you. That's to lift up the goodness of God. Enter into the fullness of who you are, bro. Like, That's what I could say about that. I just love you. I could keep going, but I shouldn't. There's another thing, there's another person, two people actually that I want to honor. Are Anita and Terry Bailey still in here? Anita and Terry, uh, Anita and Terry were my small group leaders at IHOP Kansas City 18 years ago when I was like really getting my life back on track. And I just want to honor you guys, love you. Like I'm so glad that you're here. Amazing. One more thing. Ken Fish was pretty bold last night, like, hey, clear out all my books, take all my stuff, I don't want to carry it home. That's how I feel about Aton's book over there and Connie's art. Would you just clear it out? Would you, like, buy it all up from them so they don't have to carry it anywhere else in the country? Did you already pack it up? Oi, we didn't, co- we didn't coordinate this well between the two of us, but... I love you, that's, that's me honoring you. I, I bought your book the other night, I already read three chapters. God is good. That's the end of my honoring. I'm going to jump right in. Um, this is what I want to show you first. It's just a, uh, a video, and here, he, here it is. Uh, let me set it up. Some of us participated for three weeks with five million people praying for the salvation of Jerusalem. And that culminated on Pentecost Sunday, on Shavuot according to the Sadducean calendar, with 110 million people crying out for the salvation of Israel. That's a huge victory. Here's the response to that. This is the response. And I'm just curious if we're surprised by this. Like, this is evidence that God's doing something good. Like, I I just want to point it out. One side of the coin is 110 million people. 
interceding for the salvation of Israel, primarily from among the nations. And when they culminated that time on the southern steps, this was the religious response. It's the same, it's two sides of the same coin. When the Lord's doing something magnificent, we should not be surprised when we get resistance. And I've been sitting on this message actually for 18 months. Ben and I coordinated me being able to come to the emerging leaders, the leadership, and the general conference all in the same year. It took us 18 months to figure out the right time. So for 18 months, the Lord told me what I was going to be talking about. Last night, I almost gave up because Ken Fish was so in a totally different direction. But I felt like the Lord was like, no, 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 18 months you've had this assignment. And my talk this morning really is framed out of John 16. Yeshua spends 14, 15, most of 16, and then most of us know he goes into 17 as well, setting up the disciples for the fact that he's going to die. And not only that he's going to die, but that they're going to have some hardships. And he says to them, I tell you these things. I tell you about the hard things so that in me you have, may have peace. And he makes a prophetic promise. I haven't heard a lot about this prophetic promise. In this world, you will have trouble. Anybody want to receive that promise from the Lord today? <laughs> Hallelujah. But here he says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. This message this morning, I, I, like it's a teaching, and I'm going to go super fast. But the point of this teaching is take heart. If you don't hear anything else in the next 20 minutes or so, take heart. Whatever you're going through, take heart. Whatever is happening in your life, take heart. The Lord's will for you is that you would have peace independent of what you're going through. Where do we have confidence in the victory? John 16, I've overcome the world. Where do you have confidence this morning? In what just happened between? Sorry. We have confidence because we saw what happened with Danielle and Sim and Patty. Like, can you imagine? 25? Is it 25 years? 25 years. And, you know, <laughs> Patty, you came up to me the other day and you said, Troy, I don't know what this means, but refined by fire. I could have titled this message, Refined by Fire. I thought of your book the entire time that the Lord was framing this inside of me. And what did he give me to frame this morning? It comes from uh, uh, Bechotai. The, if you walk in my commandments, I'll bless you. Here's the seven blessings on the screen. And then the rest of Leviticus 27 is what happens when we don't walk in his commandments. <laughs> By the way, he gives seven blessings, and then he gives 35 uh, consequences of not doing what God says to do. And I was like, Lord, that's just, why 35 times more, 35 to 7, 5 to 1. Why are you five times more negative than you are positive? And he was like, well, I made Jewish moms. And I was like, okay, I got you on that. Like, I hear you. But what's the lesson for us? The lesson for us is that there are benefits to suffering. There are things that we go through in our lives that can only happen if we are challenged by it. And I'm just going to jump right in. I don't even think I'm going to look at my notes. We'll see what comes out of just looking things on the screen. This is what the... the the admonition, those 35 things, this is what it's intending to produce in our lives, is repentance. Now, I think most of us in the room are corporal punishment people. Not all of us, but most of us. 
Why do we do that? We don't do it because we want to spank our children. I, I, hate, I hated spanking my children. But what was the goal? The goal was for them to go, Dad, I'm sorry, I did something wrong. And that's like the very basic level of suffering. Sometimes we have to suffer because God can't teach us in any other way. And that's a benefit of suffering. That's not something we should try to confess away. We should not try to say, Lord, we don't want this hardship if it's hardship from the Lord to produce repentance in us. Well, Troy, can you prove to me that repentance is really a benefit of suffering? Yes, and there's lots of things on the screen to be able to do that. But the point in him doing that is for us to turn ourselves back to him. That's the goal. He punishes us so that we will confess our iniquity. By the way, this is part of, part of the covenant of Israel. Is that if we fall into sin, he will punish us so that we can confess our iniquity. I just want to say, if you're from the nations, if you're, if you're not from a Jewish family, one of the things that you're grafted into is the promise that the Lord will correct you so that you can confess iniquity. Like, that's one of the things that happens when we enter into the depths of the covenant of God's love and commitment to Israel. If we do good things, He'll bless us. And if we don't do good things, He'll bless us by punishing us. <sighs> so glad to encourage you with this word this morning. Why does He punish us? So that their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt. I, I don't know about you. <laughs> I could give testimony, probably a few of you in here could give testimony of watching my heart get humbled. But you know what it produced? It produced 180 days of fasting in 2005 when I knew Anita and, Ta and, and, and Terry in Kansas City because I was like, Lord, I, help me humble my heart. It's been uncircumcised. I got some sins that I want to confess. Let me call Holly and Bill first. That's where I'll start. That's my parents, by the way, if you don't know my parents' name. But it's more than just confession. It's also the fact that we can trust that in that process, he'll remember us. Like, he'll remember his covenant with, with, uh, with Abraham and Jacob, with Isaac. He'll remember the promises that he made throughout the sweep of the Torah, and he'll remember our land when we accept our guilt. That is such a reward for us. Like, I, I don't know, you know, this, this idea of repentance is so clearly a byproduct of reward punishment. Like, it's so logical. Oh, right, if we do the right thing, he'll give us seven blessings. If we do the wrong thing for long enough, he'll give us 35 of the opposite. Actually, it's made the vote, I think. The idea of sufferings, like the, the Torah is really clear that what we've seen among our people for the last 3,500 years is exactly what the Torah promised. Like it's so intense for us. But it's a benefit of suffering. Now, I'm not just trying to do a teaching. I hope you can hear this with more than your brain. Can you hear it with your spirit? If we're expecting times of amazing thing happening in the end of the earth and culminating in Babu Chaba B'Shem Adonai, like it's going to be amazing. But there's going to be some things that fight against that. And it doesn't mean that God's not faithful. It's actually evidence of the fact that he is. And sometimes I feel like we just got to change our perspective a little bit. Again, he's going to remember the covenant in the midst of repentance un in our lives when we're responding to something suffering-related. He's going to remember us 
that he might be our God. Like evidence of him as our king is that when we fall into sin, he'll correct us. Like it's, it's a benefit. And when I say correction, uh, it, it's sufferings. Like if you read the 35 things in the admonition from the like eight, last 80% of Leviticus 26, it's not nice. Like it's not okay. What he has as a promise for us is that he's going to get our hearts circumcised come what may. Thank God. If we're all in this room, we've at least begun that process. Hallelujah. But I don't think that that process will be complete for us, at least on this side of the resurrection, until we take our last breath. Like, I'm going to be the most like Yeshua, God willing, the last breath that I take. I mean, I think about that for the Tikkun family. We're going to be the most like Yeshua as long as we can stay close to him and keep being conformed into his image. And sometimes he uses hardship in our lives to conform us more to his image, especially in the place of repentance. Is anybody encouraged in this room right now? Oh, that's good. But that's not the only benefit. I've got two more, and then we're going to pray. Sometimes he just wants to demonstrate his righteousness through us. Like I think about Job. Ken Fish told us last night, and I think many of us know this, Job is likely one of the first recorded books in the sweep of the history of the text. And what is it dealing with? Like, Job suffers crazy things. There's four very specific things that happen in succession. Sabaeans raid his oxen and donkey and kill all the servants except one who escapes and gets to Job to tell him that it happened. And as soon as he's done telling his story, fire from God burns up his sheep and the servants with those sheep. But one survives to be able to come and tell Job that the Chaldeans also took his camels and killed all their servants. And right when he's done telling his story, one more person comes and tells him that the wind blew and knocked in the house where his sons and daughters were. Like two acts of God happen and two acts of enemies against him right away. And Job's like, ah, Lord, I don't think I did anything wrong. And he goes to his friend. And his friend's like, hey, listen, I've never heard of anyone perishing who's been innocent. This is his friend's counsel for having lost a son. Two, all of his sons and daughters, actually. Like, I'm imagining what you guys went through. And your friends who are thinking just good old common reward and punishment thinking are like, well, I don't know anybody who's ever died innocently. I think it's like, Eliphaz, no thanks, man. I'm going to cash in our chips on, on this friendship right now. And Eliphaz tries... Behold, happy is the man who God corrects. Like, this is not good spiritual advice in this case. But Job's trying to work it out. He said, hey, Eliphaz, teach me. I'll hold my tongue. Cause me to understand where I've erred. And they go back and forth for like 38 chapters. <laughs> but Job then just really is turning, turns to the Lord in verse 20 here on the screen. He says, have I sinned? What have I done to you, a watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I'm a burden to myself? Any of you ever felt that way? Like, Lord, I'm pretty sure I checked myself. I'm pretty sure that it's not me. What's going on here? I just want to, that's normal. That's just normal, guys. Sometimes it happens. 
that the Lord, we start suffering things in our lives and we evaluate our heart and we've done what we can to make sure that we're repented of everything and still something's happening around us. Still something's happening to us. Now here's the, here's the crazy thing. What's the truth of Job's situation? The truth of Job's situation is that God tempted the enemy to cause him problems in his life. What did I just say? The story begins, there's a man in the land of Uz, his name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Then we get into the heavenly courtroom or into the heavenly throne room and all of a sudden, Satan, the enemy, Hasatan, is standing before the Lord. Dan, will you teach us sometime how the enemy has access to the throne of the Lord in this passage? I think some of us know. I'm just saying, like, this is a crazy, brainy moment in Scripture. And the Lord's like, what are you doing here? He's like, ah, I've just been roaming around the earth. <laughs> and then the Lord says to Satan, hey, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. He's blameless and upright, and he fears me, and he shuns evil. And the dialogue continues, and Satan says, well, of course he loves you. He's blessed by you. He's done all the right things, and your favor is like a shield round about him. And the Lord says, okay, all that he has is in your power except that you can't touch him. What? This is the Lord we love? I'm not sure about this guy at the moment, at least where we are at this part of the message. Don't worry, it'll, it'll close up a little better. You know, Asher gave this teaching one time, and I think I was like 11 years old. But you know what this was really all about? This was... The father setting up the enemy to think that he could tempt Yeshua freely. So Job was a setup in the chess game between uh, the father and Lucifer. Like what? How many of you would like to be a pawn? I mean, I'm saying this actually with my hand up. My hand's already up. How many of you would like to be a pawn in the chess game between Yeshua and Lucifer? Like, make me a pawn. Ooh, I'm the only one. Okay, there's two, three, four, five. I would love to be a pawn in that game. And if he's going to use my life in that way, I'm not going to try to confess suffering away. Like, I can't imagine. I still, I, I'm still overwhelmed a bit, Danielle, about both your willingness to be here and the moment that we got to witness I can't imagine the emotions they may have been going through, Dan and Patty, towards your parents, and Simka, and Ben against you. I mean, like, what in the world? But, Patty, just humbly, what the Lord's done in your life through that process, golly, I, I can't imagine another way. And I'm not saying that lightly. I'm saying it with a heart that's so full. With so much honor, but also it's amazing what God has produced in your lives. This is part of your story. This is part of his demonstration of his righteousness through your lives. I want to respond the way that you responded to that. If something, God forbid, were to ever happen to me like that. To see to see Job embodied in two people in the midst of us? What? But it's not just that he wants to demonstrate his righteousness through us in response to unjust suffering. I think there's something else. I think there's the fact that he wants to deepen our love for him even in the midst of suffering. I got a lot of thoughts here that I'm just going to move quickly through. The idea that unjust suffering 
but not only causes us to repent, that's just suffering. Just suffering causes us to repent. Unjust suffering might produce a kind of righteousness in us like Yeshua. Yeshua is the only person who lived a sinless life and was condemned for no sin. Other people have died unjustly, but they didn't live sinless lives. He demonstrated a kind of righteousness that earned him the name above every name. But that was a byproduct of the depth of his love and relationship with the Father. They would trust him in the midst of that kind of moment. And by the way, Yeshua knew since before the foundation of the world, and when he got to that moment, he still asked for another way three times. But someone, there's this idea, again, I, I feel like I don't have enough time because there's so much emphasis on the spiritual part of what's happening to, to really feed our brains here. But, but Solomon is upset. So, I'm not sure Solomon's really even a believer when he writes Ecclesiastes. Dan, you can correct my, my historical theology on that later. But he talks so much about the vanity of the fact that the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. Like, it really bothers Solomon. And I think it's right that it bothers him. It bothers me. And mostly it bothers me when I'm the subject of it, by the way. When you're the subject of it, oh, I want to pray for, it, pray for you, but it doesn't bother me that much. Do you understand what I'm saying? By the way, Solomon reflects on his vanities in Holy Writ. Like, his, vanity, his reflections on vanity are part of this, uh, w what we hold as inspired text. Like, that's so, that's so, I love that. I just really do. He's asking all these big questions of God and saying what he doesn't like about some things that he's seen in the scope of his life as the wisest man who ever lived, who somehow in his wisdom decided to have 300 wives and 700 concubines. I do not think that was wise. But he's reflecting on, his van on the vanities that he's observed, and one of them is that the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. And the rabbis start to talk about this a little bit, and they get into the fact that they don't know if they're qualified to talk about this vanity that Solomon noticed. It's so interesting for the rabbis to say in perke a vote, that they're not qualified to talk about the righteous suffering and the wicked prospering. That's like a mathematician saying they don't understand numbers. I mean, it's so deep that they would be willing to say that. And they ask the question over and over, and here's some of the text on the screen, but they kind of get it all down to sometimes... We feel like he's correcting us when we're not sure if we've done anything wrong just because he loves us. What? Like Proverbs 3, which is on the screen, is what they build this idea from. They build this logic from it. That sometimes the Lord corrects just because he loves and we can't find the evidence of what we've done wrong. Does that deepen your love for the Lord? Or does that chase your love for the Lord out the door? Guys, I'm thinking about the end times here. I'm going to go for it. We've repented. We've continued to suffer and demonstrate righteousness, and yet we continue to suffer. What will that do to our love? Is Matthew 24 going to be true for some of us where Yeshua says, and many people's love grows cold because of wickedness and iniquity on the earth, which is being framed against us. Like one day, we're not going to be able to participate in the economic system because we won't take the mark of the beast. Will that drive us to love him more? Will that drive us 
to search our hearts and make sure that there's no leaven in there? Will that drive us to say, Lord, we will be a witness of your righteousness on the earth? By the way, in the midst of that, there's going to be signs and wonders and miracles. I love the stories from IHOP KC over the last 25 years. We're going to be down in the basement. There's going to be three Christians and seven Jews. There's going to be two potatoes. I'm going to pray for it. It's going to become 12 potatoes. <laughs> Why? Because we don't take the mark of the beast and we're in the basement because we're hiding from uh, the worldwide Gestapo against believers. And it's not just against believers, it's particularly against Christians who said yes to identifying with the Jewish people. What's that going to do to our hearts? I hope that it inspires us to love him more. I hope that that inspires us to demonstrate righteousness in the earth. I hope that at the beginning of that process, we do take time to evaluate our own hearts. God is faithful. He's so faithful that he'll bring us benefits to suffering. And I think Paul tab, tags into this idea a little bit in Philippians 3 here. All things that were gained to me, these I've counted lost for the Messiah. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Messiah Yeshua my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of of a couple things. Whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Yeshua. Rubbish is a very kind King James Victorian translation of the Greek word there, which really I can't say into the microphone. So I'll go with rubbish. Like Paul feels about his own accomplishments and his own possessions and all that he's lost, that they are nothing in comparison to Yeshua. Verse 10, why he counts it that way is because Paul wants to know him, that is Yeshua, and the power of his resurrection. What has to happen before resurrection? Like, there's callings, there's dreams, there's purposes in this room that haven't died yet. But he wants them to be resurrected in this age and in the age to come. Sometimes it's the hardship where we finally just give it up and let it die. And that's not necessarily related to sin, guys. Sometimes it's just related to righteousness. And sometimes it's not only related to righteousness, it's also just related to love. He just wants us to understand love to a deeper degree. But Paul continues, I also do this because I want to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. Yeshua's sufferings were entirely unjust. And it shifted all of created order that was subject to sin. What could he do in your family if you suffered unjustly to be able to demonstrate righteousness and have a deeper response in your heart to his loving kindness? I, 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 again, I feel like all my words are empty compared to Simcha and Danielle standing here with Patty alongside. Paul doesn't stop with suffering. He says, I want to be conformed to his death. I, I hate this teaching. Like, it sounds like I'm a Catholic instead of a charismatic. But I'm just reading Yeshua's wor uh, Paul's words here, by the way. Like, I don't even think I'm interpreting them that much. But why? There's still a reward built in, guys. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Like it doesn't end in death. It doesn't end in suffering. It doesn't only end in repentance or righteousness. It doesn't just end in love. It ends in eternal life. 
It's interesting, though. You know, everybody gets resurrected at the great white throne. Hades gives up her dead. Everybody's standing there. Everyone gets resurrected. Everyone. Some to eternal life and some to eternal damnation. That's described in Isaiah 66, which Yeshua quotes in the Gospels. What happens in your resurrected body if you're in condemnation? The fire keeps burning. It's never quenched. And the worm, that is the body, does not die. Like, that's what motivates us to love the lost, y'all. If they don't know him, if they don't take the chance to confess him, they're in the lake of fire for forever. They feel it, and it's never, it never stops. Like, it's not spiritual. It is spiritual, but it's physical. Like, it really happens for forever. But maybe the Lord wants to use something in your life that you don't understand to provoke the ability to share about eternal life with someone. Like, our resurrection that Paul's hoping to attain is the resurrection that John describes in chapter 20 of Revelation of those who rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Like, that's what I'm after, by the way. I'm going to rule and reign with him. I hope, God willing. I mean, Paul says maybe he'll attain. If Paul may attain, I hope maybe I got a chance to attain too. To be able to rule and reign with him, and I'm, I'm trying to connect something here. I, I don't feel like I'm doing a great job with the words because it's coming from some other place. It's not coming from my brain. The Lord wants to use suffering in our lives for a purpose that doesn't make sense. I think the text is clear. I think there's lots of ways to rationalize it. And reward and punishment, that's logical. The idea of righteousness, okay, we can get there. The idea that this is what deepens our love, I don't think that's logical or even likable. Although I will say, and I'm sure many other husbands and wives in here can give testimony to it, the hardship is what makes us love each other so much. Yeshua says something similar to Paul. I think he's saying this not, not just about physical treasures. He's saying, hey, don't store up for yourself things here on earth. I, physical, yes. I mean, I think this is material. I think he's making a commentary <laughs> on the prosperity gospel where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Like picture, I, I, I think about it. That thing that you went through with your child, it's a treasure in heaven. That thing that you went through in your marriage, that thing that you went through with that, the split of the congregation, that thing that you went through with some church hurt that you still have, so you decided to join the Messianic Jewish world. Like let the Lord do some stuff in your heart. That's a treasure in heaven. Store it up. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Like if I think about the treasures that we have in the Lord, repentance and righteousness and love, man, they're way at the top of the list. And sometimes we can only get to the depths of those things in suffering. Again, I, I almost gave up this message so opposite of like, hey, stand over here and I'll pray for you and the Lord do me. I think that was all happened last night. Like everybody had a real experience. I'm not mocking that. I'm talking about how small I feel in comparison to that. I don't have a public demonstration <laughs> like Sim did. I just have some sort of weak and rambling words. But we want to be those people who are not like the heathens. I love this quote up here from the Makilta, which is like a rabbinic commentary on the Exodus. We don't want to be like the pagans who bless their gods when things go right and curse their gods when things go wrong. We want to be the kind of people that bless our God independent of the circumstances. That's who we are as a family of faith. Golly, Dan and Patty, I'm, 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 
what you've been able to demonstrate while going through what you've gone through in your lives. It's incredible to me. And I don't know the half of it. I only know the public testimonies that you've given throughout the last 25 years that I've had access to or what you've written in your book, Pat. But we wouldn't be where we are without those things. We're going to bless the name of the Lord no matter what, just like Job did. The Lord gave and the Lord took and has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's our heart disposition to you. I'm just going to start praying. Lord, that's our heart disposition to you this afternoon. Lord, our heart disposition towards you is that we're going to bless your name independent of the circumstances of our lives. Lord, whether you're in the process of giving or taking away, and some of you might be feeling like you're calling your destiny and your purpose is on the altar. But if the Lord's going to take something away, let's bless his name anyways. He's so capable. He's so able. He's so willing. Lord, and we ask for the discernment today to know when to curse something that's the work of the enemy and when to say yes to you because you want to produce something deep inside of us. Lord, we ask that you would rebuke, I ask. Ben, will you stand with me? We ask together that you would rebuke the devourer for the sake of your name. Lord, we, we want to be a people who are walking free of the hooks of the enemy, of the curses of the enemy. Lord, we want to demonstrate righteousness and love that's independent of our circumstances. Lord, our past circumstances, our present circumstances, and our future circumstances. Lord, we are asking that you would rebuke the devourer for the sake of your own name. Maybe there's a few of you that just want to be encouraged for a minute today. <laughs> I'm not sure this message has done it. But if you're facing something in your life today that you can't see your way through, would you just stand up for a minute and let us just pray together a blessing of encouragement over you? Lord, you're more than able. Our faith is independent on our circumstances. We trust you to walk us through circumstances like the ones we are facing right now. The loss of a loved one out of time. Lord, the loss of a son or a daughter who walked away from the faith. Lord, a challenge in our workplace or something economic or financial. Lord, we just say we're going to trust you anyways. Lord, encourage my brothers and sisters this morning. Encourage our family members who are facing something that they're not sure how it's going to go. Lord, bless them and strengthen them. Gives them wisdom and insight. In the name of Yeshua, one more group. Maybe you're not going through something, but you just want to decide today that you're going to commit no matter what happens next. Hineni, exactly right. We're going to say Hineni even in the midst of the Orthodox that protest us in Israel, y'all. If you just want to make an extra level of commitment, don't just do it because other people are. Lord, Ben and I are standing up first. Lord, we're committed to you no matter what. No matter the size of Tikkun America, no matter the work of Jewish voice, no matter the funding drying up, Lord, we're going to do it. We're going to be staying committed to you. Just like our forefathers, those in the text and those in the room. Just like the matriarchs that have gone before us. Lord, we stand together saying we're going to stand for you no matter what. Our love is not going to be that which grows cold. Lord, we're not going to be part of the great turning away as the temperature gets turned up. Not, amen, not by our will, Lord, but by your empowerment, by your spirit. 
like Sophia encouraged us last night, as a work that you do through us. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Lord, and in the midst of things like these, we long for, we're hungry for a breakout of signs and wonders. Lord, we're hungry to be a people of healing, even in our brokenness. Lord, we're long for. Your spirit to break out, independent of what's happening in politics, independent of what's happening in the economy, independent of what's happening sometimes and in, even inside of our own families and households. Lord, we're going to trust you. You get all of our hearts. You get all of our attention. Just everyone remain standing here for a moment. You know how this was real for Paul? Because the same one who challenged us by identifying with the suffering and the death, taking it inside ourselves to really, really grasp that, was the same one who says this, and we will charge and end with this, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, let's make it plain. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all people. The Lord is near. He nani. He says it that through the suffering, through the through the pain, we can rejoice, and God is right there in the midst of us. Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the shalom of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Messiah Yeshua. See, there is a supernatural protection of the cycle downward to mental insanity. I mean, we all need this. That He will guard your hearts and your minds in the midst of suffering so that you can truly rejoice and say, it is all for your glory. It is all worth it. It is all for you. And finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and commendable, if there is any virtue, if there is anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things and what you have learned and received from our speakers from the prophetic words, from the Spirit of God Himself that quickens our hearts and reveals Himself to us, put these things into practice. And the God of Shalom will be with you. It's not alone that we go through this life. He is right there in the midst and will never leave nor forsake us. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Please be seated for just one moment. I know that we've gone past a little on our time. And because of that, I really don't love to do it this way. But we want to recognize that it takes a tremendous team to put these conferences on. And we're not doing this to look at us specifically or to draw accolades but if you served in any capacity to help to provide the hospitality and speaking and worship and live streaming and children's care and coordination and administration, if at any level you helped to put this conference on, would you please stand up because we want to celebrate what God has done for the leadership conference and for our weekend together. Look at this. Hallelujah. Speakers, would you please stand up as well? Worship team leaders, would you stand up as well? 25% of the room, I'm thinking. 
slideshow production, sound and engineering. We are so grateful for what you've done to make this possible this week. And we just want to praise God for you. We want to say thank you, Lord, for this family of servants, humble leaders and volunteers that have made this so rich for us. Before we end, there is someone who's lost a jewelry item. If you could go to the front uh, registration table and make sure that you ask them what that is and confirm it. There will be a link on the screen, a survey to how you were blessed from this time together. If we can get to that. I'm going to challenge you right now. You know, for a leadership conference, I'm just going to tell you, we got 130-some-odd evaluations for our leadership conference because we did it together. So could you just take out your phones and for a minute just complete these questions right now together, right on your device? Or you can go to tikkunrestore.com, Restore23, and just complete this survey right here. I'll give you a minute to do that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you did this weekend. But we want to get better. We want to hear honest feedback. Is Aaron Allsbrook here in the room? Is he still here? Aaron, you come up. And then once the elders and senior leaders of Tikkun congregations are done with the survey, if you could also come up with me. Oh, by the way, for those who are doing this, we're going to make a drawing for a free registration for next year's conference. So you'll automatically be placed in the mix to receive a free registration. I have to ask whether that includes a full family. So like if you have eight kids and all that, we'll have to, we'll have to check on that. But at least one. Next year's conference dates, put it in your calendar. We've already made the preparations. June 19th through 21st is our leadership conference, 2024. And June 21st through 23rd, is our Restore Family Conference. Again, I'd like to invite all the senior leaders and elders to please come up at this time and stand right up here with me. And I'd just like to invite my wife, Lorena, to come stand with me as well. We're so thankful for you. Really, I mean, this has been something that we're going to just have to chew on for weeks because of all the things to unpack and all the things to celebrate. But we're just, we're just so thankful that you made it here. We know that it costs money and time, but wow, what a great thing to celebrate the relationships that have been forged and strengthened. And we just want to send you out with the blessing of the Lord. So Aaron, would you please rise? May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Is Adonai Panavelecha Versem Lecha Shalom. Amen. Before I give one final word to my mother and father, I just want to say we need six volunteers to help break down the sound and they need to go and see Richard. So six volunteers, if you could raise your hand right now quickly. You're not, you don't need to rush right out of here. Six. Let me get them really quick. One. 
Come on, folks. We got 250 people or so. Two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Please go see Richard. He'll give you the instructions on what to do. Listen, just so wonderful for us to be with you. Blessings on you all. The senior guys here, wow, what a great time. What love, what special. Let it be better next year than even this year. God bless you all. Go in shalom.